Thank you, Jesus, for this time. Thank you for that worship. Amen. Open with me quickly. To, we're going to speak for a couple minutes, and then my dad's here. He's going to preach tonight. But open with me to John chapter 6, and just uh, one point of the message this morning. How many people heard the message this morning? All right, okay. And then Sunday school, and then other things. Hey, Molly Harrison's here with us. Isn't that exciting? Molly Harrison is one of the best soul winners I've ever gone soul winning with. She can break someone down. It's so good. With kindness. With kindness, right? I learned a lot listening to Molly Solman, really, in South Africa. They're also one of the most patient women I've ever met in my life. Yeah, she lived in an apartment. We, I, I had the privilege of living in her apartment, and she's very particular. And she had, I don't know how many guys were in there. Five other, five guys, right? Yeah, in one apartment, it was a lot, and she she made it. She's amazing, because we weren't easy. I mean, I was 19, I had no idea. Anyway, Molly's here, it's exciting. But really, go so if you ever have the opportunity to go soul winning with Molly Harrison, it, it's fun. It's fun, really. She meets people, and she'll find everything out about them, and then she'll tell them, and then she'll say, oh, let me tell you something about me, right? And it's boom, gospel. Right, so good. <coughs> um, pray for our evangelism, by the way. We like to go out every week, and we go evangelizing, and it's so good. It's so good. We had a great time yesterday out on Main Street. Just talked to a couple people, but uh, I so much enjoyed it and uh, getting people thinking about Jesus. All right, that's the whole thing. What do you think about Jesus? The one story I told this morning was so good. There's two young guys standing there. And I said, hey guys, you have a minute? And their grandfather came in. I mean, they were 15, 16 years old maybe. I don't know, something like that. Could have been 25, I don't know. But um, their grandfather came and said, we're all set. And I said, okay, I'm not, you know, I just I have a question for you. That's all. He said, no, we're all set. I said, sir, I'm not selling anything. Just a question. He said, we're all set. And the, the boys kind of, they said, no, we want to, we want to answer your question. And they, they like they they were right there engaged in the conversation. And the grandfather was like didn't know what to do. He kind of just stepped back and waited. And it was great. It was a great conversation. But we have a thing. We have a. We want to know. It might sound simple, but this is you know I'm a simple guy. We want to know what people think about Jesus, right? What do people think? How do how do people understand? who Jesus is and what is his message and what is he doing here? Why is he, why do we talk about him? Why does the calendar change based on him? Like what's the big deal? And, uh, we want to ask as many people and find out what people are talking about Jesus so that we are better prepared to communicate to them so that we can go back and say, well, what is that point? Is that something we can study? And it's like our experience, our little social experiment. And then also we, we are, we are sharpened in it. And we have an idea of how people are thinking, what people are thinking about. And then if, if that's something, then we have, a, we have a way that we can get to them a little more efficiently, right? Have you ever talked to somebody about the same thing, but you're like this far apart, right? And it's like, I think we're talking about the same thing. Like you could talk about, we talk about God. We use the same words, we see, use the same ideas, but we're like this far, just like not even close. So we want to be, we want to be able to bring people close to the reality of who Jesus is. So we're we're having fun with that. Okay, John chapter six. And this morning we talked about what are we doing? What's our part? It was a good, it was a fun message. That are we engaged in what Christ is doing here on earth? He, in this story, John chapter 6, he, he comes and he, he feeds over five, he, five, 5,000 men are present and then also the, the women and children. It doesn't say how many there are, but there's quite a few. And Jesus feeds every one of them from one basket with five loaves and two fish. Does anybody remember what the exegesis was? Barley loaves? Loaves consisting of barley. All right, that's the Greek definition of barley loaf. It was a fascinating study last night, exegeting barley loaves. Loaves consisting of barley. But um he feeds a whole a whole huge amount of people, all right? 
so easily by his by his by his power he just so easily effortlessly feeds these thousands of people but he he engages Philip and he engages the disciples in what he is doing he asks he asks them he asks Philip personally he says hey Philip imagine that is that, have you ever been with a group of people and then someone like grabs you and they kind of like whisper something to you or they ask you a question? That's Jesus with Philip. All right, here's Philip right here. And he kind of, he grabs him and he says, like there's the 12 disciples and he says, hey, hey Philip, Philip, what are we going to do about this? Right? What are we going to do for them? And you're like, what does Philip feel exactly? Right? What are we going to do? Philip says, what do you mean? What are we going to do? All right? Yeah, I can I can group together all of our money. I have thirty two dollars. I'm gonna buy food for ten thousand people, maybe. And then, but then he said, but then here comes Andrew, and he has he says, "Hey Lord, I have five loaves and two fishes." And Andrew asks a question. This is what I want to talk about tonight, real quick. Andrew asks a question. Is it Andrew? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Andrew asks a question. Yeah. In verse 9, right? There's a lad who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are these among so many? He asks a question. Have you ever asked this kind of question to Jesus? Or have you ever asked him a question about what he's doing, about what his plan is? He said, here's what I have, Lord, but what are you up to? What are you going to do about this? How are you going to justify this? How are you going to get me through this? And I love that Jesus doesn't directly answer Andrew. He doesn't say, well, I'm going to take them, and I'm going to divide them, and they're going to feed everybody. Right? Andrew would have been like, okay, that sounds amazing. Right? But he, does, he doesn't. All he says is just tell them to sit down. They all sit down, and Jesus lifts it up to heaven. He blesses it. He's thankful for it, and it is multiplied, and it feeds and now Andrew and Philip and all the rest of the disciples are engaged in delivering this food to the people. And he calls them to be a part of it. But it says very early on, he says he himself knew what he would do in verse 6. He already knew what he was going to do. He knew the whole, how the whole thing was going to play out. He knew who would believe. He knew who wouldn't believe. He knew the whole story all the way back, all the way through. He knew what he would do. But he asks, he, he listens to their questions, and he doesn't answer them directly. So, okay, what do we do when Jesus doesn't directly answer our questions? How many prayers have you prayed that are direct questions to God? Why are you doing this? What are you doing? Right? Why would you do that? Right? And it goes on and on and on. Or what will I do with them? Right? You raise kids, you ask a lot of questions to God. <laughs> what should I do? Right. What are you going to do? Right. But there's no direct answer. And what do we do when there's no direct answer to our questions? It can be very frustrating. When you have a conversation with somebody, you ask them a question, and they just turn around and do something else. How does that make you feel? Right? <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm, I, I would like an answer. But Jesus, we, we don't require things from him. And he's not, he's not on our, he's not on our list of things where we can just pull the chain and require something from him and say like, you, you owe me an answer, Lord. Where is it? But he does say, follow me. Like when he called, when he met Philip in John chapter one, he said, follow me. When he met Andrew and Peter and John and James, he just said, follow me. When he met Matthew, he said, follow me. And in the same way, he just says, make the people fall down, make the people <laughs> sit down, right? make the people fall down. Some charismatic leaders think that now. Make the people fall down, they wave the towel, everyone falls down. But um, make the people sit down, they all sit down. And then he calls them to him, and he says, deliver this to the people. Is Andrew's question answered? I'd say yes. Look what happens in verse 11. What are these among so many, Lord? What are these among so many? Verse 11 uh, the disciples gave to them in the very last sentence, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. As much as they wanted. What are these among so many? The, uh, these little things among all of these people is enough for everything that they want, because it's not the fish, it's Jesus. And Andrew, uh, do you, does that answer your question? And when we ask questions to Jesus and he does something, 
We follow Him. We trust Him. We listen to Him. We, we are engaged in His work. And He says, how about that? And I think a lot of times when we are engaged in activity with Jesus, He answers so many questions. And maybe we don't even know that they are answered. And actually, a lot of times, maybe the question will dissolve from our thinking because we have found something better than Jesus. We have found rest in Him. We have found understanding that we didn't know before. Because we look at the basket of fish and loaves, we say, it's in, well, it can't be otherwise. But Jesus looks at it and He says, if you give it to me, and if you leave it in my hands, I will multiply it and I will make it more than enough so that everybody will be full. And we don't, when we come out of it, we don't analyze it and say, well, did he answer my question? But we come out of it and we have an understanding that is deeper and we have a fellowship with Jesus that is so much sweeter. Like it says in, in Psalm chapter 19, it's sweeter than the honey from the honeycomb. And it's better than my answers. Because I think a lot of times if Jesus would directly answer our questions, we would have more questions. And we would be more frustrated. What are these among so many? What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to do this. How are you going to do that? How does that doesn't make sense, right? How you can't multiply fish? It doesn't matter. How will you, how will you give it to them? How is it going to come to us? What do you mean? But instead, just follow me. Trust me. Have faith. Walk with me. Do you believe that I am? And just walk with me. And it says in Hebrews 11:6, He rewards those who diligently seek Him. Right? He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. He's a rewarder of those who require answers. No, not so much, actually. It's not about the answers, but it's about seeking Jesus. And when we seek him, we find more than answers. We find substance that we can trust and we can walk with. So um, are we, how are we going to reach Marlboro? Look at us. We go out on Saturday morning. There's five, six of us, ten of us, twelve of us, twenty of us, whatever it is. Still, 40,000 people in Marlboro. How, how, what are these amongst so many? We have our little tracks. We have our beads, right? We have these beads. You can tell the gospel story with the beads, right? But what are these among so many? Well, it's not really the tracks. It's not really the beads. It's not really the amount of feet on the ground. But it's the, the presence of Jesus and the ability of Jesus. And if he, if we will look to him and trust him and say, this sounds crazy, right? But that sounds good to me. I'd rather live like by crazy faith and just be bound up in reason. Right. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pastor Phil Norman. Father, uh, Father, we are gathered in your presence, in your name, the name of Jesus, the only name under heaven and earth by which man may be saved. And you have saved us. You have justified us, sanctified us. You are going to glorify us and you have knit us together because you wanted to. Because you want your people together in your presence thinking and acting and looking like you. Not because of your ego, but because of your holiness, because of your purity, because of your righteousness. You want us to be a, the earthly manifestation of purity, holiness, righteousness, love, mercy, compassion, and grace. And so here we are with an expectation because of who you are. And we thank you in Jesus' name. So digging around in uh, in some family papers uh, a while ago. The last time I was here, uh, I was talking about my aunts, and it was a little out of hand. Yeah, I, it was it was frivolous to say the least when I started speaking. I talk. I know it was, but my my eyes. No, I won't go back to it again. I'm sorry. I repent. But anyway, I want you to, digging around in some family papers, I found this one little, everybody remember carbon paper? Yeah, okay, a carbon paper copy of something that my, one of my aunts wrote. And um, you, it might sound a little familiar to you if you were in service this morning. 
because um, this is the story of four bodies. Somebody, everybody, anybody, and nobody were neighbors. Odd people. They were hard to understand. The way some of them lived was a shame, and everybody knew it. For example, somebody was gossiping about his neighbors, and everybody knew it was wrong. Anybody might have refused to listen, but nobody did. Anybody knew that everybody was talking about somebody. All four belonged to the same church. Anybody wanted to worship, but wouldn't go to church because he wasn't speaking to somebody. Nobody was faithful at church. Nobody tithed. Nobody sang in the choir. Nobody did the visitation. Nobody worked in the church. And when they needed a Sunday school teacher, everybody thought that anybody would do, and somebody thought everybody could do it better than he. Guess who was the one who finally did it? (laughs) A fifth neighbor moved into the neighborhood. He was an unbeliever. Everybody thought somebody should visit him. Anybody could have made the effort, but didn't. You know who finally won him to the Lord? Nobody. So when I gave you nobody and everybody and somebody and anybody at the offering this morning, it was the edited short version. Anyway, I love my aunts, the twins. They were wonderful. They were, they were probably some of the first believers to pray for me, you know, back when they first heard I was coming before they even knew who I was. I'm sure they started praying for me, you know. And and knowing that, you know, it's good stuff. Knowing that. So, Father, just uh, take the rest of this time and and, uh, let it be for somebody here. Jesus' name. Um, I've just started teaching. I'm um, the the story. The three churches. That was a real story too. That I could have if we'd gone with that option this morning, because I'm very intimately, closely related to three churches right now. Obviously, Greater Grace World Outreach in Baltimore, where I'm, you know, we live there. I'm an assisting pastor there. My brother-in-law is the head pastor there. Uh, we've been there for 30-some-odd, more than half my life I've been with Greater Grace. Um Greater Grace Christian Fellowship, Marlboro, Massachusetts. My son pastors here. My only granddaughter's here. You know, you think you think I want to be here more often? Uh huh. <laughs> and then uh, Sailors Union Grace Church, 454 Cross Street, Baltimore, Maryland. There's a whole story behind Federal Hill is the other thing. It's in Federal Hill, the neighborhood of Baltimore is called Federal Hill. So the Fed Hill Church is, is also very uh, important to me. My nephew, Pastor Justin Schaller, pastors the church there. I'm one of the elders in, in uh, the Fed Hill Church. And so I knit into this, this ministry, you know, and uh, I can't think any better place to be. Whether I'm here, whether I'm there, or whether I'm the other there, you know, I'm I'm always knit in with the with the body. And so I'm, uh, I just started teaching uh, the Book of Romans in the Bible study we do on Tuesday nights at the Fed Hill Church. And so I just we we drove up Friday. Uh, last night was the concert. Today after lunch, next thing I know, I'm out walking in the woods. You know. Scouting deer stands and this kind of stuff. So anyway, I didn't have much time to study, but I knew I wanted to talk about something that I started talking about in, in Fed Hill in the Book of Romans. And so um, that's what we're going to talk about. And I'm going to turn to the whiteboard and, and put some uh, a fancy term that probably a lot of you are familiar with. And that that doesn't put me off. It's always good to talk about things we're familiar with when you're talking about people who have been around the Word of God for a while, you know, because it's always good to bring these things back up again. Probably people are, some people here already know where I'm going. And now they're sure they, that I, they know where I'm going. We're going to talk tonight 
about the hypostatic union, and I'm going to turn back around and face you again. You should be forewarned about that kind of thing, because that means you're going to have to face me. Okay, the hypostatic union. Do a little exegesis here. This is going to be a little more complex than loaves made of barley. Hupo. Greek prefix hupo means below. Underneath, beneath. Okay. Stasis, the Greek word stasis, from which we get static. Static electricity, if you all know, is static. Static electricity is electric current that charge that builds up in something that's standing still. It's not flowing like current through a wire. Right? Static electricity. Stasis is standing. So the hypostatic union, the understood union. Okay, what does it really mean to understand something though? What is it? I mean, we all know what we mean when we understand something because we understand it. But what is it? Why do we use the word understand when we're talking about understanding things? Because any time we're going to build up a system of logical thinking or a, a system of doctrine, if you will, it has to stand on something and it has to have something under it upon which it stands. So that's why we use this term, hypostasis. You have to understand the nature of Jesus Christ in order to really, really know what he did, who he was, why he did it. Give you an idea, and this is, you know, this might be an aha moment for some people. It certainly was the first time I read this portion and, and um, exegeted it a little bit. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we have, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Substance. Faith is the hypostasis in the Greek here, in this passage. Faith is that which all we hope for is built on. Everything, all our hopes as believers are, are standing upon the foundation of our faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it says there. Now faith is the substance. It is that which is standing underneath the things we hope for. And it is the evidence of things not seen. And just to finish out the verse in, in the Greek, the word evidence there, I, I can't remember the Greek word and I didn't have time, but it literally is in a legal sense. That's the evidence that comes to court and 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 confirms the final decision in a court of law. It's the convicting evidence, the absolute you know, the, 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 the evidence we need that absolutely proves this is true. So everything we hope for is built on our faith. And our faith leads us to this conviction that these things are true. And even though we don't see them, we believe. So um, what do we understand about the nature of Jesus Christ? Uh, I'll go to Romans chapter one, which is the the passage. This and I've got just I've got nothing more in my notes here than a list of a bunch of scriptures that we're going to go to. We're going to look at these scriptures and see how they relate to what we call the hypostatic union. And in Romans chapter one, verse one, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David. I like writing stuff out while I'm talking, because one thing, it gives me a few seconds here once in a while, but it also gives you folks two different ways of having it get into your brain and, you know, Helps us learn everything. 
made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God. Declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So in these, this verse here, or these two verses, verses 3 and 4, we have Jesus Christ, made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. So we have Jesus Christ, flesh and blood, 100% human being. We all know in, in uh, Matthew's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel, we have genealogies. And the genealogy in Matthew's Gospel traces through from David, through Solomon, down through all the, the kings to Jeconiah, who was the last king when uh, Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Jerusalem and took the people captive into Babylon. And on down from Jeconiah to Joseph. And then in Luke's gospel, we have the genealogy. And it goes, I'll just briefly summarize, from David... It also goes down to Jesus, but it goes through Mary's line. And if you compare the two genealogies, you find the difference starts in, in if you looked at it in terms of the books of the Bible, the, the difference in the two genealogies shows up in the books of in, uh, First and Second Kings, um, where you have uh, Solomon and so on down to Jeconiah. And Jeconiah does some compromising here. He tries to make deals with Nebuchadnezzar. And Jeremiah prophesies that the, th- the throne will never return to Jeconiah's line and that he will be the last king in that line. Now, this is the throne of David, which has pro- been promised already to be from everlasting, or from David on through uh, everlasting ages. And that there will always be a king on David's throne. But that line comes to an end at Jeconiah. And so we have to go over to Luke's gospel. And over in Luke's gospel, we see the line goes not down through um, that line through Jeconiah, but it goes through David's son Seth and down through So that there we have Mary's lineage. And Mary was the only flesh and blood parent that Jesus had. And she was of the correct line. So that the the throne of David can continue on. And um, so it's important to know that Jesus was made of the seed of David according to the promises, fulfilling the prophecies, according to the flesh, real flesh and blood, human being, fulfilling the prophecies. And he was also declared to be the Son of God. No hair, no, no lineage really there. You know, we don't have line after line of begattings and generations and generations here. We have God, everlasting, Everlasting. Son, everlasting, everlasting. The Son of God, the the seed of God, God. One with God the Father, eternally existent. Again, fulfilling all the prophecies. And how do we have this? This was according to the flesh. This was according to the Spirit. How do we know this? Because we have the lineage, the the, um, the whole genealogy line. How do we know this? We have an empty tomb. Any questions? <laughs> we have an empty tomb. Declared to be the Son of God according to the Spirit of Holiness by the resurrection from the dead. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to to the faith among all nations for his name. So, we have Jesus Christ, 100% human being, 100% God. Purposes, fulfillments of prophecies, purpose. Yeah. 
Can anybody else, could anybody else do what he did? Could anybody, any human being have done what he did? No. But could it be done by anybody other than a human being? To die and pay the price for human sin? No. Had to be done by a human being. And it was done by a human being who was unlike any other human being. Um, further on this point, um, another interesting sort of, this is just a fun thing to do when you have your Bible and some time on your hands. Uh, start looking up 316. Yeah, you know, everybody knows John 316. If you've watched a, a sporting event, you've seen the sign and everything, you know. John 3.16, everybody knows it. Read through some 3.16s. You'll really be, you'll be built up. And 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. God was made manifest in the flesh. We have to understand this. We have to have a hypostasis of this because so much of our faith is built upon it. This is a foundational thought, so it doesn't hurt going over it again. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Let's turn there. This will, we, we got a few verses here, so we'll, we'll spend a few minutes with this one. And we didn't have to read that far into the book of Hebrews to find something referring to the hypostatic union, but because it starts right out with uh, you know verses two and three and four, speaking of it. But we're going to jump to chapter two, verse nine. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now the word perfect in the New Testament Greek, almost every time you see the word perfect in New Testament Greek, don't think about being the, the absolutely spotless, you know, tie just tied, you know, just the right length and the, the narrow part of the tie isn't hanging out below the wide part of the tie and, you know, no, no moles or, you know, bald spots or any of that. So that's not, that's not what perfect means in most references in the New Testament Greek. The word perfect is, um, teleos and it's the same word that is used as, uh, it comes with the same root telos as a goal in a sporting event. All of a sudden, all the sports fans here are thinking, hey, cool, sports and biblical theology, they do go together. Yeah, and, and they do. The idea of perfect in New Testament Greek is not that you're spotless and blameless and, you know, have everything all together the way we think we should be when we start our lives as believers. What it means is that we've accomplished a goal. We've reached an, a, a goal. We have achieved something. That's what being perfect is in, in New Testament Greek most often. And so um, what it says here, um, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of our salvation perfect through sufferings, that he accomplished the goal of our salvation through sufferings. When Jesus Christ was on the cross, one of the very last things he said just before he gave up his spirit, he cried out to Telestai. Perfect tense. It is finished. Could also be perfectly well translated as it is perfect. It is done. I have achieved the goal that I was sent for. What I came to do, I have done. That's 
the perfection that he achieved through suffering on our behalf. And by the way, when it says here, bringing many sons unto glory, the word technon there in the Greek, I seem to be pulling Greek up right and left tonight. Uh, technon is, is actually a gender neutral word, and it's, it's many children, so, um, sons and daughters takes more space to translate. Many sons, that's the shortest way we could do it. Um, For both he that sanctifieth and they that who are sanctified are all one. Okay. He that sanctifieth, Jesus Christ. They who are sanctified, all of us. We are all one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children, us, are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise himself took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. So, purpose here? To destroy the works of the devil. He had to become flesh. God, he was already God. Always had been, always will be, never wasn't. He had to become flesh and blood to destroy the works of the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Who is in heaven day and night constantly making intercession for us? The man, Jesus Christ. The glorified man, Jesus Christ. How did he, how, how could he become the glorified man except that he was first and always God Almighty? This is not just a New Testament concept either. We'll go back and look at some Old Testament references here in uh, another very um, well-known passage of Scripture. And we're coming up on that season. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, handles Messiah. Every year right after Thanksgiving at the Naval Academy, the, the, the choir does a performance of Handel's Messiah in the chapel, and it's wonderful. If you're ever down in the Baltimore area, and you've got some reason to come visit once in a while. If you come right after Thanksgiving... Go online. The tickets are available now. Go to the Naval Academy and get your tickets to see Handel's Messiah there. You know, all these beautiful and wonderful uh, Naval Academy uh, midshipmen in uniform. And they sing beautifully. And one of the lines that they sing, everybody knows the Hallelujah Chorus, but if you, if you, if you do the whole performance, the whole Handel's Messiah is about two and a half hours worth of music. So, uh, it's, it's quite a bit. But one of the first things they do is, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The Son is the Father. If you ever end up tangling with Jehovah's Witnesses and they start talking about all the mispronunciation, you know, mis, 
uh, translated things in the Bible. You uh, Give me your New World Translation right there. Let me have that for a minute. Go right to Isaiah 9, 6. And you say, look at this. Your own translation says that the Son is the Father. Gee, sounds like you don't understand your scriptures. But we we understand our scriptures because we know that the Father and the Son are one, that there is no separation between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. We speak about the Trinity because our poor feeble human brains have to sort of divide things into parts so we can understand it. But God is... Father, Son, and Spirit. God is all three, all the time, inseparably different, but identical. And um, so the Father is the Son. And he became the Son so that that government will someday be on his shoulders. And just so that we don't start thinking that our Old Testament understanding is not verified by New Testament understanding. In Galatians 4.4 4, we see that, but when the fullness of times was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Purpose here again. God, and we'll we'll touch on Philippians chapter 2 soon. God, the eternal, almighty, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God, became a human being, the Son, in order to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because we are sons, God sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. There's the Trinity right there, too, in those verses. God sent forth the Son so that he could send forth the Spirit. Let's go back to the Old Testament again because I wanted to make sure this was a two testament lesson. To Micah chapter five. And in verse two it says, But thou Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So again, the father speaking through the prophet to Bethlehem says that the eternal one who has been from everlasting will come forth from you. And one more trip into Isaiah. And it was good for me to just, you know, because this was, this is not a, a doctrine that I had struggled with or had any, you know, feeling that it was, you know, that I had doubts about or anything. But it was really good for me to just sit down and dig around in some of these verses and, and see how soundly and how broadly it's taught in scripture. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name God with you. And Matthew, of course, Matthew is full of, you know, um, and Matthew's gospel was written to Jews, and he was constantly reminding the Jewish people that this is the fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy. And he re- he recites uh, Isaiah 7 as well. 
So we're, we're, we're starting to circle the airport here. We're, we're coming down to just the last few. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go just one other briefly. I, I, was, I mentioned this one to Sal earlier this morning because, you know, Pastor Bailey was talking about Philip so much. And, you know, when you've got a biblical name and, you you know, your name appears in Scripture, sometimes you've got to sort of look around and, you know, what has it got to say about the guy? You know, maybe I could learn something from it. And back when I was a really young believer, you know, didn't really know anything except that Jesus Christ had died for me and I'm saved. You know, I was having struggles with something. I don't even remember what now. Thank God I don't remember most of the things I've had struggles with. But um, whatever it was, what I do remember was that in my you know naive state at the time, I was thinking, God, you need to help me, and I don't know where to go and how to do it, so I'm just going to close my eyes, open my Bible, and, and you're going to tell me exactly what I need to know. I'm sure of it. Please do that, Lord, in Jesus' name, because I need it. And I went to John 14, verse 9, and it says, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? (laughs) Now, yeah, I know a number of you have biblical names here, yeah, so you might find similar things yourself, you know. Bethany, House of Bread, uh, yeah, I don't, yeah, but, um, yeah, I never did that again after that. <laughs> I never felt I had a need to do that whole blind, yeah, God is just blind luck, and I'm going to find the answer by, no, I never had to do this. Enough of that. What I wanted to turn to was John chapter 8, and I got you fairly close by doing that one. Um, John chapter 8, verses uh, 58 and 59. Again, um, Jesus was confronting the leaders of the the synagogue or the the temple, and um, he says to them, "Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am." There are a number of places in Scripture where Jesus says, "I am." Um. When the, when the soldiers came to get him in Gethsemane, and he said, "I am He," they fell down. Just from from him speaking the words, they fell down. Um, here, the reaction's a little different. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Here's this guy that they they think they finally trapped, and they've got reason to stone him to death, and they got the rocks in his hand, and where did he go? Uh, that, he's gone. That's him way over there walking. He's, I I can't throw that far, you know. But that's just sort of an interesting thing to think about. But the point here. And the point, the reason they picked up the stones, and later when he was being tried, they said this. When he said, I am, here in verse 58, he was saying, and he knew he was saying, and they knew he was saying, and he knew they knew when he said it, he was saying, I am. He was declaring himself to be God in the flesh standing before them. They didn't like that. Um, one of the one of the others, and I, I looked at this real quick uh, this morning, um, because Jesus did not say follow him or follow me to Nathaniel, but in um, the beginning of uh, in John chapter one, when Jesus uh, is speaking with Nathaniel, he basically there he says, you know that that you will see the heavens open and the angels of God descending and ascending and descending upon the Son of God, man. And, you know, he, he declares himself numerous times to be exactly who he was. He wasn't going to lie about it. 
There are times when he chose not to state it, but he also chose on a number of occasions to state it blatantly and clearly. And in John 17, just to wrap up John's Gospel, in verse 5 we have again uh, another one of the purpose clauses. You know, why we should understand this. John 17, uh, Jesus praying to the Father just before he's taken away uh, into his uh, final captivity and his crucifixion. And he says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have and, and they have kept thy word. Yeah. Now they have known that all the things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. So here again, Jesus is straightforward, unabashedly saying, I have been one with the Father since before the world existed. And I have been manifested here in the flesh that the glory that God had shared with the Son, if you will, that's slipping a little bit on the idea, but that the glory that that God had, Father, Son, and Spirit, from before the foundation of the world, that that glory might become ours also. Remember that passage in Hebrews that it uh, it was um, I can't remember the word exactly, but in bringing many sons to glory, that the captain of our salvation would be made perfect through sufferings. Here he is, right before the sufferings, saying, this is your purpose. This is our purpose, Father, that these people would have this glory. And hours later, it is finished. I have done it. I have fulfilled my purpose. I have accomplished the goal. And then finally, the last passage I want to look at, as I said earlier, I want to look at Philippians chapter 2. This is one, if you have a um, keyword study Bible, Spiros Zodiades goes into length there in his notes about how this passage um, reveals the, the hypostatic union and the necessity and the reality of Jesus Christ being both God and man being fully human, being fully divine. And it starts with, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now form, in Platonic Greek, uh, Plato's philosophy, the forms to the Greek are the perfect, complete, 100% essence of anything. We in this world, this mortal world that we live in, we have an understanding of what that is. What is God? God is perfect. God is, you know, powerful. We, but, but we can't see God completely. We have a, we have a dim understanding of God. But it's, it's more than that. Uh, for the Greeks, there's, you know, there's like the perfect man. Yeah. Except he didn't have bifocals on, you know, of course. <laughs> didn't have that scar in his nose. Hey, yeah, I can't do it. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not the perfect man. I live in this mortal world where we aren't, we aren't the forms. The form is the perfect ideal. That perfect in that spotless, blameless, you know, blemishless sense that I was saying, um, perfect in Greek. Teleos doesn't, refer to that, but the form does. Okay, so back to our verse. Being in the form of God, Jesus Christ was everything 
that God is. Every, the, the, the absolute perfect representation, not representation, the perfect manifestation of who God is, is Jesus Christ. That's what, that's the, the, the power that the word form has in, in the Greek, um, here. But he didn't think that was anything that he should, you know, boast about, cling on to, hold up and, you know, see this? Um, But he made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself. This is called the kenosis chapter. Kenosis emptied himself. Made himself of no reputation and took upon him, took upon him, it wasn't his eternal nature. His eternal nature is that he is the form of God. But he took upon himself the form of a servant. He became, for our benefit, And for his glory, he became the absolutely perfect, complete servant. So much so that he was obedient. (laughs) You got size 13, so this happens once in a while. (laughs) Okay, let's, let's get that one out. Okay. It took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He was made, you know, in a human body. He was made of the seed of David. Declared the son of God. Declared because declaring is simply stating what he already was. But made of the seed of David because he became a human being. He entered time and at a point in time, became a human being. And when he became that human being, he became everything that a servant should be. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation. It's already in there. You're not, you're not achieving your salvation. You're just bringing it to the surface. So that you can reveal the glory that has been given to us, which was Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane, and which was his purpose. It was his purpose before the world began. That we would share in his glory. That we would be like him. Uh, 1 John 4, 17, we shall have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this present world. Father, thank you so much. We don't deserve it. We couldn't earn it. We don't merit it. We can't achieve it on our own. We can't even think of it on our own. But you have accomplished it for us and given it to us Again, back to hypostasis. Because we have believed and our faith is the substance, the foundation, the understanding that we have, that you have done these things and they are our hope. In your name, amen.